Welcome to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts. I'm your host, Doug Peters. Along with me today from the Zamboni Company is Marty Elliott. Our guest on today's episode is Michael Schwann. Michael is a vice president with CAA ICON. Today, we're going to be talking about Climate Pledge Arena, as well as some of the other projects that CAA ICON is involved in. Glad to be here, Doug. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, and how the uh, the path that you traveled to get to um, ICON? Sure, glad to. So I've been in, a, in and around construction uh, most of my life. My family was in construction, so I found a passion for it at a very early age. I went on into schooling for construction management, uh, graduated with a degree and got into sports construction in and around the year 2000. I began my career in sports construction with Hunt Construction Group. I worked for them for almost 13 years. And then in the fall of 2012, uh, I left Hunt Construction Group and came on to CAA ICON. And you are based out of North Carolina. Have you spent your entire life and career there or did you grow up somewhere else? I did grow up somewhere else. I'm actually born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I lived there for the early years of my adult life, uh, and I was also fortunate to work on two sports facilities in Pittsburgh, being both the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Pittsburgh Penguins. My travels have taken me as far south as uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, working on what was known as Dolphin Stadium at the time, and as far north as Toronto, Canada, for the uh, engagement on a project that was not sports related, but was a opportunity for my firm when I was with Hunt Construction, Construction Group to work with a firm that was bidding on the Pan Am Games in 2015. Great. I, you mentioned earlier, and it's one of the things that uh, I caught while we were um, leading into this podcast, is that you don't provide products, you don't sell products, you're not a reseller of them. What services is and what makes uh, CA ICON special uh, and uh, ahead of its competitors? Sure, glad to share. So CAA ICON, formerly ICON Venue Group, we focus on two uh, specific service lines. Those are venue development and strategic advisory. Uh, again, we don't actually sell products, and our services really are our people. We are now about 100 people strong between those two work streams. And within the venue development work stream, um, our focus is really on project management and owner representation. We are a group of individuals that will uh, be sourced by a client to help them uh, develop a project either from early inception or something that is already begun and we'll see through the entire construction process both from a design construction and commissioning and closeout perspective on our strategic advisory uh, service offering that particular group is very focused on uh, market analysis feasibility and return on investment and that group is a, a smaller group within our overall team but they uh, perform a very valuable service to our clients. Does your uh, job end when the building is done or do you continue on for a period of time? Uh, when does the uh, company that you work for walk away from the project considering it completed? Sure, we often stay on throughout the end of a project. And what I mean by that is through the punch list, substantial completion and final completion process, but actually extend our term through the one year warranty period. So we like to always be there for our clients um, when they need us and seeing their project through um, often until that final payment is made uh, for the overall construction of the project. Okay. Um ICON's been involved in a number of multi-purpose buildings that house NHL teams. Can you share some of those with everyone listening and talk a little bit about your role in the development of those facilities? Sure, gladly. So prior to um, my engagement and coming on with ICON in 12, 
there were many facilities that um, ICON um, uh, performed performed on, um, with many of them being on the west coast, but a few on the east. Um, the facilities for the Colorado Avalanche, the Phoenix Coyotes, um, and also the New Jersey Devils are a few that uh, were per, per, um, uh, that we uh, performed on uh, prior to, to me coming on board. Um, post that time, we have performed on facilities such as uh, PPG Paints Arena for the Pittsburgh Penguins and also have consulted on some other uh, venues um, and some worked on some venues that house some minor league teams. How early would ICON get involved in a project? And let's say that it's uh, a building that's being talked about. Is it something that is months in advance, years in advance? Uh, how far out are, are you guys going on a, the development of a project? Yes, it often can be years in advance. Um, it can start off with just simply an idea um, and a phone call is received by our firm and we begin to engage with a client team to help them build and, and foster that idea. But also it can be as soon as months where they may have been working with another team, uh, they may become unsatisfied, um, or they may just be working amongst themselves with their own um, uh, um, teams to start to develop um, their plan for a new project or and or a renovation, I don't wanna forget that. But um, it can be, like I said, years uh, and sometimes just months. The Zamboni Company has been involved with an organization that used to be uh, IAAM, and now it's the IAVM. And architects used to be a big uh, part of that organization. Uh, they seemingly have drifted away from the organization. What do you think the future is for organizations like the IAVM um, with companies like Spectra, AEG, Oakview, uh, starting to develop their own internal meetings and maybe having uh, some trade shows that uh, they incorporate into their meetings? I think there's also always going to be a, a, a role or a spot for that organization. Um, as we all grow within the industry, um, those organizations that have been there um, for many years prior um, in my opinion, will we'll always hold uh, hold value as we march forward. Michael, what's your favorite uh, project that you've been involved in, the NHL building project with uh, ICON? Well, uh, I'm gonna be a bit biased, but NHL, it will be PPG Paints Arena in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If um, we remove the label of NHL, but stick with hockey, uh, specifically, it was a minor league facility. Uh, my favorite arena project throughout my career was the Giant Center Arena in Hershey, PA, which is the uh, home of the Hershey Bears, which is the affiliate of the Washington Capitals. I've seen a few pictures of that, and I think we sent the machine out that way not too awful long ago. And I, uh, it matter of fact, I think it was in Baltimore a year ago that we had it because the machine was brown, uh, like Hershey's milk chocolate brown. And I think there was a struggle to get it that color, but uh, we were successful. Can you share I'm any? Not, not, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I'm not surprised that it was uh, labeled or branded with the uh, the Hershey chocolate color. Yeah. It, they're a big company out there. I think that they do uh, quite a bit for the community and uh, employ quite a few people out that way. Absolutely. Can you share any future projects uh, that are not confidential or, or ones that uh, you guys are working on uh, going down the road? Well, um, interestingly enough, um, with what we've all experienced as a society here in 2020 uh, with the pandemic, uh, there were a handful of projects, um, not so many NHL specific that um, were starting to get penciled out on, on whiteboards. But uh, as you can imagine, um, with um, the opportunities lost to act um, in a normal operating mode, 
um, some of these projects um, are considered delayed at this time. One of the big ones that uh, you're working on and that uh, we've been working with you as well is the Climate Change Arena project in Seattle. Uh, can you expand on that uh, project and uh, how many people you would typically have involved in a project that size? Sure. Um, I will be somewhat limited with my response. Uh, I am close to that project, but close at a distance. Fortunately, uh, one of the lead members of our team um, had been repositioned from Seattle into our Charlotte location office. So most of my knowledge of that project does come through him. But uh, many of my peers that I am close to are part of that project team out in Seattle. Uh, the undertaking of that project um, from its inception was very unique in which the roof structure of the existing uh, key arena was to be saved and with that required a an intense planning and procedure session to be able to support that roof where construction could occur beneath it before new roof supports were put in place. Our team size on that project I want to say is a total of about six to eight both on and off site that project is scheduled for completion in fall of 21. And with um, uh, such a, um, uh, an intense type of project in an aggressive timeline, the remarks and news that we receive out of that project here in Charlotte are that all members of the project team, both ICON, CM, and design have been performing above and beyond. That's great to hear that. And it kind of, you, you beat me to the punch a little bit on one of my questions uh, about the arena. Since that project started with an existing structure versus a clean sheet of paper that most uh, facilities like this would start out with, what issues did that pose for your company uh, in getting it built? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, um, finding the right engineering team to be able to look at what needed to be accomplished in the most efficient and economical manner. Um, also, finding the right construction team that could take on something that required uh, above and beyond from a planning um, and scheduling uh, work product that could, um, could, could meet the needs of that project. So, you know, knowing what the battle would be going in um, and having the right people to execute it to perform at the highest levels um, that 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 was the key to that project no pun intended <laughs> michael are there different challenges that you've run into with the the facility in seattle based on the world that we're having to live in today there have been um, that particular CM team um, put together a health and safety plan to be able to keep that project active. That project was deemed as an essential project. So as other construction projects in and around Seattle may have shut down, that project was to remain active. So there were times where um, the pandemic, uh, I'll just say, nipped at them a bit and, and decreased some of that, uh, the, the, the manpower that would be available for that project. But um, the members of that construction team and all the other project team members worked together to do their best to maintain um, a active project. You guys are also involved in the Belmont project, are you not, in New York? That is correct. Uh, we have a very limited role on that project. Uh, we were brought on specifically, <coughs> excuse me, to manage the furniture, fixtures, and equipment procurement. And uh, is it a major challenge in dealing with multiple facilities or multi-purpose facilities of these size and scope? Is that a big challenge when you're trying to tackle them at the same time? Well, I don't, I don't want to sound too egotistical, but um, the simple answer is no. And, and the reason behind that is what we do and how we look at ourselves as an organization is that 
we are able to support each other um, both across North America and in some instances over in Europe um, where we're activated again at now. So we feel that with the skill set that our personnel um, possess and the support network that is in and around them, not always on a daily basis, but in a as needed basis, we can come together as an organization to make sure that as we're working on multiple venues in multiple marketplaces, we always have the necessary bandwidth per se to support those projects. Back in the 90s, there was an explosion of buildings that either were replacement buildings or new buildings that went up. And I'm trying to draw on my memory to see what it, if what I can recall uh, as to how many different companies were uh, handling that. Do you foresee seeing anything like that kind of growth happening again uh, in the future anytime soon or ever at all? Well, I, I tell you, in my opinion, it seems like in our industry, everything is very cyclical, that we have ebbs and flows. We, we have um, strong growth years and then we have slow growth years. So um, I wouldn't say anything more than that. I'm always expecting it to come back around or, or I always believe that there's an opportunity that that could occur again. Do you think that uh, buildings have a shelf life or uh, arenas have a shelf life or are they being designed to allow for changes or upgrades that the marketplace will demand or desire in the future? I think that in previous years, and I'll say a decade or two decades ago, I think there was some degree of shelf life and that was mostly built around bowl design and sight lines. I think that the honed skill set of our designers and what they've accomplished through creating multiple levels of multiple offerings with great sight lines, that the changes in what will affect shelf lives of buildings is how they can continue to take spaces that are designed now and functional and reimagine them with more of a facelift. I think that um, there's always that opportunity where buildings will come down and new buildings will come up. But I think the overall goal is to work within structures that may have been built within the last 10 to 20 years and make them last longer. Find new ways to help reinvent spaces, reactivate spaces, and continue to provide the best fan experience available. How difficult is it to design a building for multiple sports? Because uh, watching a hockey game and watching a basketball game, it, it doesn't, it, re it requires different sight lines. And I go back to my time growing up uh, in Minnesota and the Target Center was built after I came out here to California they opted to try to do a floor that had screw jacks that they would raise it up and drop it down depending on whether it was basketball or hockey thinking that they were going to get a hockey team in there i is this something that uh that that was the only time i know of, of a floor being done like that what challenges do you guys run into when you're trying to design it so that all the fans whether they're watching hockey or basketball are going to be satisfied Sure. No, that 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 still exists today. It's it's existed um, f forever in time, in my opinion. The sight line and the seating layout between an event such as ice hockey versus basketball is dramatically different. The positioning of the scoreboard um, and the LEDs that may be underneath the scoreboard that are used in a basketball type setup um, can be challenging. Uh, for making use of or making good use of during during a hockey event. So um, we continue to do our best, and it really starts with the design side of when we do go multi-purpose with an arena between those two specific sports to try to identify best fitment for all of that. Um, unlike what you were describing with raising and lowering of floors, the um, – common solutions now are the adjustments within the seating. So we're either seeing seating units that are movable or portable um, that 
completely swap out for a different type of seating unit to change that seating position and or we're seeing seating, seating units that are often labeled as variable rise units that tend to be a bit more um, expensive in their, in their, in their um, uh, capital cost that can be the same unit, but it is adjusted um, for uh, rise heights to try to provide the best solution possible. Ultimately, to get your best sight lines, if you can be a basketball specific arena, or a hockey specific arena, that is when you achieve your 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 best fan experiences for sight lines. If you were to have to um, bring in two different types of seating, or is it the the seating companies now have the ability to adapt their seat structures that are the portable sections? Obviously, you can't do something about a concrete bowl, but are they able to adjust the existing seating, or do they have to have two sets of it? We're still seeing uh, a common practice of two sets of it. Um, there is a vendor um, within the U.S. that works with the um, um, adjustable type uh, units. Uh, we're seeing some European manufacturers performing um, similar uh, engineering to provide those solutions. So um, there, there are a lot of options out there. With the climate change arena and the fact that it started out as a basketball rink. I know that they are basketball arena. I know that they had hockey in there before, but did that add to the challenges now um, with it being the focal point of hockey in the building or uh, did it really not make it that much more challenging? I can't speak specifically to the challenges, but within the case of that particular arena and the fact that they were removing everything beneath the roof line, they were able to reset that arena to be hockey centric. And do you have any idea if that's going to be able to uh, adapt easily? Uh, should they get a basketball team, whether it be pro or minor league? Often what happens in arenas that are hockey centric that are uh, also going to implement basketball, they'll look at that and either identify if they want to place their court at the center point of the sheet of ice or they want to offset the court and make the basketball uh, event occur in a bit of a horseshoe uh, type seating configuration so there are ways to take a hockey centric arena but also implement basketball into the arena but again, it goes back to you're going to end up sacrificing sight lines uh, for your basketball audience. My father was involved with the Met Center in Bloomington, Minnesota, which was the former home to the Minnesota North Stars. And as I was told when I was younger, they were bolting seats in on opening night as fans were coming into the building. Uh, do you guys have any concerns about the completion of the climate change arena or have you ever had any major issues on an opening night in any of the projects you've been involved in? I can't say that I'm aware of any issues for Climate Change Arena. Um, we often um, find that um, as we are marching towards the end of a project, um, there could be something, an element, a product that um, will be delayed or we may need to pay a bit more attention to to make sure it arrives on time so it can be put in place for the opening. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say we had challenges or we've had challenges uh, over the years, but um, as far as openings are considered, um, we do make that opening night um, all the time. Um, it may come down to the wire in some instances um, for reasonings that are controllable some instances uncontrollable in others, but um, I can't say we've ever had an experience where we've not been able to make an opening day. How much fun would life be if there weren't challenges? No doubt. Um, I can tell you specifically on one of my um, projects I was the lead on in uh, San Antonio, Texas, uh, major renovation in a extremely short window. Um, we made opening day within 30 minutes of doors opening. <laughs> that's that's amazing there probably is a little bit of sweat maybe a few tums eaten that day that's those are the moments when um you, you really you really dig in it's all hands on deck 
Um, I experienced uh, working right next to my client and making sure that we, we opened it uh, before those doors opened. Big sigh of relief and maybe a beer to celebrate once it's all done, I'm sure. Absolutely. It's Lone Star down in Texas. <laughs> there you go. There's a lot of thought uh, being put into buildings about going green, and the Climate Change Arena project is one that is uh, trying to be completely uh, carbon footprint free, I believe. Uh, how are you guys at uh, CA Icon navigating that for future building projects? We completely respect the green building in the green building process. Um, we have great respect also for sustainability and using uh, sustainable materials, not only for the construction, but for the continued operations of these buildings. Um, in, within our industry, in, in just kind of reaching back over my life experiences, um, there had been and there continues to be often uh, a lot of waste um, that occurs on our project sites. So if you just start simply by thinking about the recycling process that um, we take part in um, on our projects, it's such a, such a key component to um, being able to maintain and be a good steward um, for everybody within that marketplace, but also globally. It is equally important that when these buildings are operating, um, and to steal your phrasing, reducing or zeroing that carbon footprint um, is, is, is really key. Um, we, as a society, um, I'll say, can be wasteful, uh, can be neglectful at times. So I think um, our ongoing support of that type of building, um, that type of operation is key, and we would hope that other industries do follow suit to the same. We've been using the tagline drive to zero, and it's something we're excited with this project that uh, they will become the second NHL team, along with the Montreal Canadiens, to be using electric ice resurfacers. I, it's something that we're enjoying working with them on this and uh, helping them to be that. Uh, where do you see um, things going in the future? What kind of new advances uh, can you share, if any, uh, about buildings and what things might look like 20 years from now? I think that's a fantastic question. And I really wish I had the crystal ball so I could begin investing in it um, because everybody's gonna want those solutions. Um, I don't have anything particular I can put my finger on right now, but it's amazing um, within our industry of how quickly things advance, how quickly new systems and solutions come onto the marketplace that um, create those environments we're talking about right now. With the world we're living in today, how is COVID impacting the design uh, or future design of projects that uh, you folks are working on? Well, I can tell you this, um, when we came into the new year and COVID uh, reared its ugly head, Q1, Q2, a lot of conversation uh, began to occur about how these buildings may have to be redesigned. As we've all learned more about COVID, uh, learned more about the virus, we, or I've seen um, designers still continue to look into it. But I've also seen that some of the early reactions that were occurring with design have settled down a bit, which I believe uh, is the appropriate path forward. I think we need to consider these impacts, but I don't think we need to be considering um, what I'll call extremely radical changes to how these venues operate. I think that more subtle changes are where our focus is right now and what we should all work towards continuing to focus on. Do you think, Michael, that the, the changes that uh, will happen in these buildings will be more uh, not necessarily in the spectator area, but in the concession area? Uh, restrooms, that type of thing? Or do you think that there will be some changes where uh, seating is reduced in some of these buildings? 
I'll start with the reduction in seeding. I think in the immediate term, we're going to see seeding that will be unoccupiable. I think that as we continue to work through the pandemic and we are allowed jurisdictionally to invite fans back into buildings, there are going to be restricted seating capacities. I don't see that as a long-term effect. What I do see as a long-term effect are creating environments or situations where we can go into a more touch-free or touchless solution, such as um, uh, 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 non-contact uh, restroom fixtures, non-contact means of payment, um, directional signage, helping people understand how to maybe buy a beer with less of a crowding occurring, buying food with less of a crowding occurring. I see also betterments to the quality of air that is brought into our buildings for comfort, both in hot and cold conditions, also in ventilation and filtration. And that's one of the areas that we as an organization have been looking at and studying on what we consider or call indoor air quality improvement. We often see that we operate both in our commercial spaces, in our homes, with maybe the incorrect filtration devices, which allows us to get sick, even with calm and cold. But there are solutions out there to help protect all of us and provide a better air quality to breathe. Now, is there a COVID capturing solution? No, there isn't. But if we can create a betterment in a, a, a healthier, healthier and safer environment, um, just from that standpoint alone with indoor air quality, um, we're starting to win the battle. Do you think some of the changes that are likely to occur in arenas or buildings are gonna last forever? Or do you think that there's going to be some that might be temporary? There'll be some that will be permanent and there will be some that'll be temporary. The temporary solutions, um, I can speak from experience with the clients we're working with now. Um, on the temporary solutions, they would like to be able to find economical solutions, being that they would be temporary, but they are very concerned about the health and safety of not only their own staff, their players, but the fans. From the permanent solutions, uh, our clients are more um, willing to make investments in permanent solutions, solutions that are going to be what I'll call simple betterments um, to the way their facility operates. So it's making more sense to them to make those investments. How do you think the buildings are gonna be impacted? There's been a big push and I think some of it has died down a little bit and I think rightfully so. Uh, but you know, if you've had, let's say that they have an arena, I'm thinking the Honda Center where the Ducks play and obviously you're not gonna get the 17,174 people in there uh, to start out with, but how are they gonna go about addressing the cleaning of everything if they have to wipe down armrests and seats and uh, that the impossibility of that's got to be uh, hard to comprehend I would think well it's, it's interesting that you bring that up Doug because that has been a common occurrence as buildings were to be cleaned um, it's occurring now what the bigger difference is is being certain on the use of the appropriate cleaning products. Products that have uh, FDA and EPA approvals for properly disinfecting seats. We're also seeing solutions that have been in the marketplace but are now being more emphasized, such as electrostatic sprayers that can be controlled by drones in which a building operator can operate a drone both in an indoor outdoor facility that can come across seating systems and fog the seats to provide the necessary levels of sanit sanitization and disinfecting. It's interesting because I've read some articles about how they're going to get fans and I'm not you know 
I'm probably less cautious than I should be, um, but I just look at things and go, I've seen numbers that uh, show to me that uh, even though I'm older, uh, don't have a spleen and probably should be a little more cautious. I just look at it and I'm not worried about it. But um, there's some things that they talk about being out there in the forefront and being visual where it's more of a placebo than what it actually is doing to make it better. But if that creates calm among the guests at the facilities, that's a good thing. Is that a balancing act that you folks are involved in, in discussing these types of things with your clients? Yes, uh, we, we have many conversations um, similar to what you're describing. But I would say that what um, has really um, not been shocking or surprising is that our clients are reaching directly out to their fan base. They want to hear back from their fans what they would like to see implemented within their buildings to make them gain that comfort to come back. And we wholly and fully support that. That, that is the, the best approach you could take uh, in lieu of trying to make these decisions without your fans' input um, would, would not produce um, great results. So we're seeing a lot of our clients either doing self-surveys with their fan base or reaching out to third-party marketing um, specialists to help them develop surveys specific to um, what they should be asking their fans and getting that feedback back, um, categorizing it and analyzing it to help make their decisions for what they should do. But also within the same breath, um, they are all governed um, by the leagues that they operate in and at league levels, uh, we do have experiences um, with a handful of leagues and assisting them with helping them develop surveys and their approaches back to the franchises to help understand how buildings have operated, how they may want to operate, and then also um, information gathering from these franchises so the leagues can start putting together appropriate protocols and procedures for the reopening of these facilities. One of the challenges I'm sure you have to run into is the different states uh, with a pro within a project. A uh, project in Florida or Texas, Arizona, may be completely different than uh, what you're going to run into based on the, the present situation in a state such as California, Oregon, or Washington State. How do you balance that out to be able to offer up your services to the customers across the different regulations they're faced with in each state? Truthfully, we don't find it uh, as, uh, in, as insurmountable or as difficult as it may seem to be. Um, when we go on to a project and we are working with um, our client teams, that is, is probably one of the first things that we start to key our focus in on, on jurisdictionally, what can and cannot be done. And with our large database of projects in all corners of the United States, we have a bit of been there, done that approach so that when we do go back into those marketplaces again, um, we are already uh, prepared uh, to some degree. Do you think that retrofitting of buildings is going to, originally when this all broke back in March, uh, there was a, a, a big learning curve. And I think that we're, we've calmed down a little bit and we're taking deep breaths. Do you think that there's going to be a bunch of retro work out there to existing facilities? Or do you think that it's going to simmer down eventually uh, to where we can modify how many people come in as opposed to making massive changes within buildings? Again, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that kind of in, in near term, long term. I think in the near term, um, the retrofitting is going to occur. Um, I think we're going to see both temporary and permanent. Um, in the long term, um, there is going to be less retrofitting acquired, in my opinion. Uh, I am a bit of a glass half full uh, uh, personality. Uh, I believe um, that we will find solutions. I believe that we will come out of this pandemic 
smarter, more knowledgeable, and, and, and probably more nimble um, should something like this happen again. Biggest impact to a sport or industry uh, by the COVID that we're currently faced with. And uh, obviously outdoor buildings are going to get by a little bit easier, I would think, um, even though maybe not because they hold more people. What, what's your take on that? Interestingly, you, you went where I was going to go first with my answer. Um, the biggest impact, uh, in my opinion, is to the indoor facilities. Um, it's to those leagues that play in a closed environment. Um, the outdoor facilities, um, even though they may have higher seat counts, they've got more flexibility because they are um, outdoor environments. However, even in our outdoor facilities, there are, there are elements of interior spaces. So uh, it, it, the, I, I guess I would answer it in, in, in this manner. The, the greatest impact is the, um, the, the loss of being able to have the fan at the event. That, 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 is, that is what I think is, is the greatest impact. Many, or I shouldn't say many, but some of these leagues, and for example, uh, the NHL, um, a key uh, part of their revenue stream is the ticketed fan. And when you can't have the ticketed fan, or you can only have them at small numbers inside the, inside the facility, um, that is extremely uh, impactful to their product. Yeah, it, it's probably of the major leagues, it's the one that cannot survive without having uh, ticket sales. And that, that's because it's so close to our business uh, and what we're providing the product to rinks uh, and arenas, uh, it's obviously a concern to us that the facilities uh, are able to have uh, fans attend the games. The, the NHL doesn't have the TV contract that the NFL has or that the NBA has or that Major League Baseball has, so it needs to figure the way to operate their business uh, with fans in the stands. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Michael, do you think there's going to be, and maybe you guys are already doing this, do you think that there's going to be time spent uh, developing ways to get fans in and out of buildings? And maybe this is going to be more impactful if you're trying to put 100,000 people into an SEC building uh, down in Louisiana. Is there something along those lines that's maybe going to change that uh, you guys are working on to develop? Uh, flow patterns for buildings? Yes, um, we actually have been studying um, a few solutions. Um, one is labeled as time entry ticketing. Uh, another is labeled as patron tracking movement. And there are firms um, that already existed um, out there in the marketplace that had Similar type solutions that um, were not as uh, widely recognized as good viable solutions that could be implemented. So we have been looking into all of that tech that's out there. And from a time entry ticketing solution, the idea uh, from a concept stage is that the fan would have a e-ticket and they would receive a notification um, maybe approximately 24 hours before the event that asked them some very simple questions about their health and they would answer back um, and if they answer back in the positive um, the ticket would be released um, uh, to them and when the ticket is released they would also release a time to enter uh, the facility with a very specific uh, location for entry to try to um, uh, limit the massing that we all have experienced when we're going into any type of, of event in one of these facilities. Um, from a patron tracking movement perspective, once you're in the building, um, similar in nature, it's a tech solution where you would be able to alert an individual via their smart device should some crowding or massing start to occur or if they should be walk, walking towards an area that has already has some crowding or massing to alert them that, you know, if they want to, you know, um, navigate away from that, they should, uh, it is recommended that they, they go in a different direction. So um, there's tech out there right now that we're studying. 
um, that um, we're, we're, we're trying to continually educate ourselves on so that as our clients come to us and, and talk to us about solutions that are in the marketplace, that we can help point them into the right direction to um, um, look at these as solutions for implementation. We're going to guess that your favorite projects has always been NHL buildings, but do you have a favorite project that was not uh, a hockey-related building? Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to go with my biased answer again, uh, which was my first sports project, which was Heinz Field, again in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, 1.2 million square feet of NFL football stadium that, uh, again, first sports project, um, first project that I worked on, which had a massive project team. I was part of the contracting side at that time, and we had about somewhere around 25 people on staff. And it was just a unbelievable project as a young 26-year-old to be part of at that time and see how collectively um, such a large group of people, not only in our own contracting team, but the subcontractors we had on board could come together to perform and build that wonderful facility. The question we initially had started the word with the word does, um, but I'm going to ask it differently. Did your or will your job require a lot of travel in the future? Because does your job require travel at present, I'm going to guess is a pretty big no. So when the pandemic came around here this year, um, we shut down immediately from a to from a no travel in a remove yourself from the office, work from home um, environment. I traveled for the first time um, since the beginning of the pandemic, the last week of June, and I've traveled an additional four times since then. In a standard year with 52 weeks in that year, um, I'm often traveling 40 weeks of those year, 30, sometimes 35 to 40 weeks of that year. So um, the travel has been greatly reduced. I actually just talked to a client today who asked me to come into the New Jersey marketplace um, um, only if I was comfortable. And um, I will be traveling here the week of Thanksgiving um, up to um, that client's facility to uh, assist them with um, um, some services we are providing for them. But I'm guessing that probably will be my last travel experience for the year. Favorite hotel brand, since you traveled quite a bit? Absolutely. I will proudly admit that I am a Hilton guy, and um, uh, I very much love that brand. I feel that brand provides the level of comfort that I look for when I am on the road. Um, the other big brand that starts with an M always feels a bit too fancy for me. And uh, I, I am just looking for those, those basic clump comforts when I, when I enter a hotel at the end of a long day. And have you made Lifetime Diamond with Hilton yet? I have not made Lifetime Diamond. Uh, fortunately, um, uh, Hilton is being very kind to me. Uh, they've extended my diamond status through 2022 uh, because they know I haven't been able to travel as much as uh, uh, I, I've been wanting to. But um, within that travel here coming up in the next few weeks, I, I will be staying at a, a Hilton there in, in, in the new, uh, New Jersey market. Well, I hope to welcome you into that lifetime diamond status with Hilton. I've made that shockingly, and thankfully I made it uh, about a year or two ago before uh, all this broke out. But I uh, did that primarily staying at Hampton Inns, which I found to be very accommodating and uh, give me everything that I need to have in most of the locations that I get to. Uh, does I, I am I like go, I was going to say I like the Embassy Suites uh, brand that is that is uh, or, or flag within within Hilton. Um, the 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 separation between space uh, with their room layouts uh, can often make um, uh, my 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 work life uh, much more easier uh, when I don't have my my office uh, my normal office here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, it, it's I enjoy the embassy brand when I am staying in a location uh, for a longer period than one night. But usually my travels at uh, 
had me staying at different hotels uh, every night because I would be driving uh, within a state. So um, definitely understand your take for that. The breakfasts are always nice and uh, the hosted happy hours are pretty good too. What would be your favorite uh, destination for either work or fun, whether it be within the U.S. Uh, or abroad? Well, um, with my tenure here at ICON, um, not all of my work has been sports and entertainment related. Uh, we are fortunate that we have performed well for our clients, and our clients are very diverse in their portfolios. And one of our clients specifically is uh, has a business within uh, the energy marketplace, specifically liquefied natural gas. So from about spring of 17 through early 20, we had that I managed and I oversaw uh, multiple projects in the Caribbean, um, two projects in Jamaica and one project in Puerto Rico. So I would say uh, from a work environment, it's challenging to work in the Caribbean, but from a uh, more of a, a personal uh, response, uh, I very much like the feel and the experience of, of the island life. Is that challenge avoiding getting a sunburn when you come back before you come back to the office and have to explain why you have a sunburn and you're down working? It, it, I would I would label it more like a farmer's tan. <laughs> <laughs> I had the opportunity years ago to travel down to San Juan, Puerto Rico for uh, some instruction on our machines in an arena that they built almost got killed while I was in there because they started the building and then it got delayed and then they had some insulation that got saturated and it fell about 10 feet from where I had been standing only moments earlier um, but it was an enjoyable trip I understand uh, your desire your love of that part of the the world I've visited a couple times to the Caribbean and if it wasn't so far away from California, uh, I'd probably be there on a more regular basis. Favorite sports teams that uh, you root for? I'm going to guess it might either be the Eagles or the Browns since you grew up in Pittsburgh. Can you fill us in a bit there? Um, I'm going to ignore those remarks from you, Doug, <laughs> and let you know that my allegiance is to the three teams that sport black and gold in western Pennsylvania. Army? I didn't think Army was it. I thought they were in New York. <laughs> we we have a major league club in uh, in that marketplace. Um, they they have struggled mightily um, for a long period of time, but uh, I I will never never give up on them. Um, and uh, very proud to say, um, you know, uh, Pittsburgh is a, a a drinking town with a sports problem. <laughs> well, I still have a little bit of chafing on my backside from when the Steelers beat my team, the Minnesota Vikings, I think it was down in Tulane uh, Stadium was when that happened. Uh, but that was way back when I was young and way back when the Vikings were good and way back before they were dumb enough to bring a guy like Kirk Cousins on as a quarterback. Um, but your, your baseball team, I do remember Willie Stargell and I believe, didn't they win a title uh, when they had Burt Blylevin pitching for him, a former Minnesota Twin pitcher. Yes, the um, the the Pittsburgh Pirates actually, from a um, historical perspective, um, I want to say have won five championships, um, and they're one of the oldest active teams, continually active teams within Major League Baseball. Um, our last pennant was in 1979, which was also the the, the infamous uh, uh, phrase that we were given, the city of champions, because that was the same year the Steelers won their fourth Super Bowl trophy. So, um, yeah, they, there was um, there was some really fantastic baseball players that, that came through the Pirates. Um, and, um, you know, uh, what we have now are, are more just some memories, but we're, we're hoping to create some new ones as time goes on. Well, and then if the draft might have gone a little bit differently instead of Sidney Crosby going to Pittsburgh and Bobby Ryan going to the Ducks, 
might we have sported a few more Stanley Cups than just the one that we had. But Sydney and the Pittsburgh organization, very happy uh, for them. Got a friend who works at the practice facility. That's the Lemieux practice facility. And uh, that's a great facility as well. And Pittsburgh, great town. Uh, food related. What might be your favorite go-to food? Is it switched to barbecue now, or was it barbecue in Pittsburgh? And maybe you've advanced that now in North Carolina, or what is your go-to food that you go for? Sure, I'll, I'll answer this two ways. Uh, when, I'm at, when I'm home, uh, when I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, it's all about the pig. Uh, I love my barbecue down here. Uh, I am a, a damn Yankee, uh, and I mind my P's and Q's, but uh, Eastern, Eastern Carolina barbecue with a vinegar-based sauce. There's nothing like it. Um, I often smoke uh, a pork shoulder out back on the weekends and make my own. Uh, when I'm on the road, I try to keep things a bit more simple. Uh, big salad guy. Uh, grew up uh, in a family that there was always a bowl of salad on the table every night. And um, I try to continue that healthy lifestyle when I'm on the road. So have you ever been to Minnesota or Chicago? I was in Minnesota uh, in mid-January, and I believe the temperature was around minus 20. It was beyond cold. Um, I did not enjoy that experience, <laughs> but uh, I, I can say that um, it was uh, uh, it was a, a uh, it was nice to be able to to get to Minnesota just because I had never been to that state before. Was anybody kind enough to take you to a White Castle? No, no, but um, you would be surprised um, at one point in time uh, where I grew up in, in Pittsburgh, uh, White Castles did exist. Okay, so are you a White Castle yay or nay guy? It's been years since I've had White Castle, so I can't say that I remember the taste. If it, I believe it's, it didn't have like the chopped onions on the hamburger, the mini hamburgers. Was that the, the go-to with them? Yeah, the sliders. They're 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 a, the a delicate cuisine, a delicate cuisine that is best served to prevent a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, is there anything that you want to talk about with your company? Are there any organizations that uh, your company is a support of? We've had numerous uh, guests on here. Uh, one of my favorites, and unfortunately, he just passed away. A good family friend. Travis Roy uh, played one shift of hockey at uh, Boston University at the Travis Roy Foundation. Uh, is there anything like that that you would like to talk about or uh, promote uh, while we're on the podcast? Well, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, that's interesting that you brought up that, that, that young man. Um, I can remember uh, following um, the incident that happened and watching some of the um, um, uh, uh, information that was developed uh, on how he has coped uh, with what occurred there. Um, so unfortunately in a, in a young hockey hockey player's career. So I, I did take note of that recently in his passing and, and it's very sad that he did pass on, uh, but it seemed like he was still able to, you know, live a very uh, fulfilling life with some of the limitations that were cast upon him. Um, I would say there's really nothing that, I would promote um, beyond that, um, you know, CA Icon, um, we're very proud with what we do. We're very proud with what we've done. Um, we're very much looking forward to the future of our company. We recently had a change at our highest leadership levels where Tim Romani has stepped into a chairman type role. And we are now fortunate to have Mark Farha and Charlie Thornton take on uh, new leadership roles as co-CEOs, which we as an organization, uh, one, are very fortunate to have those two as leaders. Uh, they've been with the, the organization um, over oh, 15, 16 years, and based on their positioning um, within our two office locations in the U.S., Denver and Charlotte, it has given us uh, a balance within uh, the U.S. marketplace and has just, um, even in the short time, it's only been about six weeks, um, uh, shown to be um, something that was a nice refresh for ourselves as an organization 
where we've got the highest level of leaderships really on both sides of the country. And I know that both those gentlemen uh, will continue to steer and guide us um, to make sure that we maintain um, our high level of standing um, with our, our past clients, our current clients and future clients. So I would, I would just close with the message that, um, you know, Icon, while we may be a younger company, um, we continue to show our growth. Uh, we continue to perform and we're continue, we, we continue to be so excited to work with vendors like Zamboni and other vendors that provide other facility solutions. So at the end of the day, um, we all achieve the same client satisfaction. Well, thank you for that. And we look forward to working with you as well, Michael. It's when the world gets back to some form of normalcy, uh, we're hoping to get together down in North Carolina where we can sit down with you and Mark and anybody else within your organization to talk about our products, to let you know what kind of advancements we've got to uh, make the ice quality better in these multi-purpose facilities. Thank you, Michael, for spending time with us today. We want to thank everyone for listening in to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts podcast. Have a question for one of our experts or an idea for a future episode, please email your questions or requests to info at Zamboni.com. For more information and additional podcast episodes, please visit Zamboni.com forward slash podcast or search Ask the Zamboni Experts on Apple Podcasts Google Podcasts, and Spotify. This is Doug Peters wishing you an ice day.